And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Moonwalker, who had a near-death experience in 2010, where she dissolved into the universe, realized, and encountered the source of all creation. Moon, thank you so much for being my guest today, and welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. All right, Moon, my audience loves to hear about near-death experiences. So if you don't mind, can we start on the day yours happened and go from there? Yes, we can. That was a, that was a landmark day. Um, leading up to that day, October 8th, 2010, I had I was 41 years old, and I was in about my third decade of depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. I had a suicide attempt in my late teens, became a meth addict. Oh gosh, I had an abortion. I married my drug dealer. I got pregnant again. Life changed, quit the drugs, joined the military, kind of straightened out my life on the outside. But I'd had a lot of trauma growing up, physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. And all of that was still stuck in me. It was still my identity. And even though I had a really successful military career and, you know, I walked around with a smile and I had possessions and all the influence and the things that, you know, you're, you're told make a person successful, I was still that wounded, hurt girl who didn't know how to love, who didn't know how that, that that didn't feel lovable, didn't have any self-confidence, nothing like that. And so I had joined a unit that was going to Afghanistan, an army unit. And my plan was to come back dead. That was my that was my final glorious suicide plan because mm. it would look a little honorable and it wouldn't mess up my kids as much, right? Um, so that was my plan. We were about ready to deploy in about six months. And then doggone it, I sabotaged my own suicide with an NDE. And so that morning I was going through my third divorce. Uh, my husband was out of town and we'd been fighting kind of text and phone all night. And I was exhausted and just, it was Friday and I just wanted to get the day over. So instead of driving to work, I hopped on my Harley Fat Bob, which is a gorgeous bike. I love it. Um, and rode to work and I was at Fort Knox, Kentucky in October. So the fall leaves are out and the road to, to work was just winding and beautiful. And by the time I got to work, I was much more relaxed and much more calm. But by the end of the day, I was right back up into that uptight, wound up crying mess. And after work, I'm sitting on my motorcycle and I, and I just, I don't, I don't, I'm supposed to go to this organization and help with a, an event for people with disabilities and uh, challenges. And I just, I just couldn't, there was this voice in my head saying, who do you think you are? Nobody's going to miss you. What do you, you don't have any value to add. This is just stupid. Just go home. But I didn't want to go home. I didn't want to go home alone. Um, and then I hear this other voice that says, Hey, you want to go sing karaoke at the bar? Mm. That was a much better choice for me at the time. So I, followed them. I was following them to a, 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 on a road that I've never been on. And Fort Knox is known for its tanker units. Um, and I crested a hill going about 45 miles an hour. And it was when the tanks crest a hill and curve, they'll go to the outside track because they're so wide. And those metal tracks eat up the outside of the asphalt. And I was distracted. I was crying. I was upset. I was not paying attention. And I didn't see the debris in time. So when I saw it, there was just no reaction time. And I'm like, oh, shit. And the next thing I know, I'm in this. I, I At the time, I didn't even know what it was. I was just in this space. And I couldn't feel anything. I couldn't hear anything. And all I saw were these like beautiful, beautiful, like sparkly lights going past my vision. And I didn't know what they were. And there was no like background behind them. It was just kind of a gray fuzz. And so I followed one of them. And as I did, I saw my feet bouncing on the highway. And so part of me put that together and realized I must be being drugged by my motorcycle down the hill but I couldn't scream. I couldn't say anything. I was just frozen. And then all of a sudden there was this big explosion and the bike had landed in the ditch and it kind of snapped me out of it. And the wheel 
the throttle had got stuck. And so I'm underneath my 850 pound motorcycle with the throttle stuck and my arm had been ground off by the wheel, got stuck in the drive belt. And so I'm screaming and freaking out. And so I push off of that, pull myself out and I'm just running down the road screaming. And I, I saw my arm and it's gone. It's gone from here, clear to the wrist, down to the bone. And just the artery is shredded. So that when you shred an artery, massive bleeding out, four and a half, five liters of blood in the human body. This kind of injury, you have one, maybe up to three minutes, maybe. Um, so my coworker stopped the pickup, got out, laid me down in the ditch and she didn't stay with me because she was a combat vet and she had PTSD from what she experienced in Iraq. And so she was having her reaction. And I don't even know what that was. I don't know if it was freezing or panic or scream. I don't know what it was because she was out of sight. So I'm laying there in the ditch by myself, realizing, oh, I'm dying. I'm getting thirsty. There's no way out of this. This is it, right? And, and I looked back at my life kind of just in a feeling sense. I didn't see a video of all the highs and lows or anything. And I realized, oh, wow. Yep, just nothing but regret and remorse. That's, that's all I feel, just regret and remorse. And I'm laying there and I know that it's over. And I'm looking up and there's these beautiful leaves blowing in the wind and the clouds in the sky. And, and so I thought, I'm just going to enjoy it. And so I did something I hadn't ever really done in my life. And I took a long, deep, intentional breath. And I focused on the sensation of the air coming in through my nose and filling my lungs and expanding my belly. And then just naturally leaving the body. And I was like, wow, that just really felt good. And so I took another one and wondered if this was going to be the last one. And I thought if it is, that's okay. I'm just going to, just going to surrender. And when I did, I had relaxed my body. And when I, when I surrendered, that's when I like everything changed. I, it's hard to, hard to describe it. I would say that my consciousness left my body because I couldn't even feel my body. I was, I was a, I was a part of a whole. I was the tree. I was the wind. I was the grass. I, I, and I, and I wasn't any of it at the same time. It's very strange. And I'm in this space and there's nothing but peace. I felt so peaceful. And I thought, wow, this is not what I expected. And at that point, I hear a voice. And to say I hear is kind of a, a it's not really the right word because bodies hear. And this was a consciousness to consciousness thing. So it was, it was expressed from me as much as it was to me. And the voice just said three words, it said, you are mine. wow, you are mine. And I realized that that was the source, that the creator within me and around me and of me and that I'm part of just affirmed that I belong. Something I've been looking for my whole life, right? And just all, just everything fell away from, from my, my idea of who I was, my identity completely shifted. And God, source, universe, however you want to call it, talks to you kind of in the way that, that you have um, designed and expressed yourself in your, in your human form. And so I heard, now that I have your attention, let's have a talk. And it's going to be a one-way talk. So I just rested in the messaging that I got. And everything that was said and done completely shifted who I was. In that experience, I was able to look back and 
connect all the dots in my life and figure out how I got in that ditch. And the amazing thing was that I got me in that ditch. I did it. And my whole life was focused on blaming other people, especially my family and my mom, for everything that was wrong in my life. I was, I was recycling these old traumas from my childhood. And when you do that, that becomes your now, becomes your future. It just perpetuates itself. And I was able to look at that. And so, and I was able to look at certain beliefs I had about myself and ask, is that really true? Where's the evidence for it? And Jeff, I just watched all of these beliefs collapse, just collapse. And it was the most beautiful experience. And then somebody grabbed my arm and put a tourniquet on me and started asking me questions. So I was still kind of in that space and asking, you know, answering questions. And then it dawned on me because I was back in my body. I was like, oh, oh, I'm going to live. Oh my God, I'm going to live. I got so excited, Jeff. I, I was like almost jumping out of my skin because I had just had a revelation that my whole life had been on replay of childhood traumas. And that I, I wasn't at all who I thought I was. I had believed in other people's stories. And now that I knew that, I was so excited. I was like, I don't know what this means, but it's going to be freaking fantastic. And so I did get air flighted to the hospital and uh, they, they amputated, the hand, amputated the hand and did all, those, all, all sorts of surgeries, put, put a flap from my stomach on my arm to cover the bone. And I left there 30 days later just excited to live. And for a good four or five years, all I did was just have fun. I cut out all the people that I used to associate with. I ended up um, getting fired from my job. I wasn't deployable anymore. I sold everything and moved to Idaho and moved in with my sister and got to know my family, which I was not close to at the point. Um, still ended up getting divorced. Okay. You know, I transformed. He didn't, it doesn't matter. And I just had fun. I wanted to experience life. I trained for a half marathon. I did kayaking and whitewater rafting and, and just explored and had opportunities. And then one day I met a man who was missing a hand and missing a leg and he got to talking to me. And he asked me about my past and the military is like, oh, have you ever shot archery? I said, no, no. I went into a store about a year ago and asked if I could, you know, learn. And the guy looked at me and he said, ma'am, there's a two hand minimum for archery. I was like, okay, all right, two hand minimum. I'm just gonna let that go then. And so this guy rolls, he leaves, he leaves and he rolls back in this big four foot target. And he hands me a bow with a leash on it, kind of a strap where on the string where if you had fingers, you would pull it back. And he tells me, now put that down between your, your back jaw and just hold. And then just push the bow away, aim towards the target, and then relax your jaw. And I did. And it was just enthralling. I, I absolutely loved it. And so he offered to coach me. And within a couple of days, he said, you know, Sam, you don't have any bad habits to break. And I think that if you do everything I say, you can make history as the first woman to represent the United States in women's open compound archery. And I mentioned this story because of what he said next and how it relates to my near death experience. He said, now, Sam, the difference between average or normal and exceptional or champion isn't the skill of archery. It's not who has the best skill. Skills can be learned by anybody. He said the difference between normal and exceptional is how strong are you between this year and this year? And that, that, that clicked with me because I was like, yeah, the skills you have determine the quality of your life, what you're capable of doing. Those are driven by how self-aware and how much self-mastery you have between this year and this year. And that's, that's something that really stuck with me. And through the archery journey, I started learning some things that started 
opening my eyes to what happened in my near-death experience. How did those shifts happen? Do those kind of shifts take an outside divine source to create in somebody? Or are they things that we can learn to do and build our self-awareness and our self-love and our self-mastery? And that set me on a course of, of years of learning about, you know, just all the different techniques for transformation from the spiritual to the biological, neurological, traditional, new age, new concepts, all of them. And to, to kind of close that circle, I did end up making the Paralympic team and representing the United States in the 2016 games in Rio. Um, so my near-death experience was the beginning of my life, not, not the end of my life. And I often tell people that I, if I could have my arm back, if I could just have this arm back, but I had to be the same person who put herself in that ditch, the answer is no. I, I see my arm as the greatest gift, the greatest tool for self-awareness that I could possibly ever have. Because when I look at it, I realize how powerful your thoughts are. What you think does manifest in your life. What you put your focus on does manifest in your life. And everybody can change their life at any moment if they choose to, and they're dedicated and they have the right intention. Moon, thank you for sharing that experience with us. I feel like first you had an OBE before your NDE because it appears that you were actually out of your body during the actual accident. Yeah, I never lost consciousness. Um, and then when I when I surrendered after the breathing, that's when I that's when I left my body. So yeah, I guess I had never identified that I did have an OBE. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I was saying that when you were actually crashing the bike, at point of crashing, it seemed like you were out of your body. And then you came back in when the cycle stopped and it was on top of you. Yeah, yeah. And the interesting thing that I have learned um, from what I, from, from studies is that that particular chunk of my experience I was in a, like a, I was in a flow state. And this is, this is a state that everybody has been in. It's where you lose track of time. You're not even aware of your body for, so this can be relatable to everybody. When you're driving the route that you've been driving, you're, you know, repetitively over and over and over, you'll leave work and all of a sudden you just find yourself at home and you don't even remember the trip between you're in a flow state where you're just completely disassociated from your body and you're on autopilot. So for me, I was in a flow state where I was totally disassociated from my body and only visually aware, just like when we're driving down the highway. So yeah, it was an amazing, amazing experience. I've interviewed a lot of people and a lot of times when people have serious trauma to their body like you did, they're out of their body at the point of that trauma. It's a natural response of the body. You know, the opioid uh, system kicks in, you go into shock um, because your, your, your body is in survival mode and panicking will take a lot of energy. So it's doing all the things that it knows to do to keep you alive as long as it can possibly keep you alive. And I got to I got to give credit to my body. It's got a really kicking, you know, opioid system because mm -hmm. I didn't feel the removal of my arm. I started feeling it later, you know, as I'm being life lighted. But during that whole experience, even when I was laying in the ditch, I didn't feel that trauma. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my consciousness was free to go wherever I focused it. And had I focused it on really bad things or the fact that my coworker wasn't there or whatever, I could have absolutely spiraled and got myself all wound up in anxiety and shortened my life because my heart would have been beating even more. So um, it's incredibly powerful. Our bodies are amazing. It seems like you had a different type of life review. Like a lot of my guests will see their life review like watching a movie. But it kind of seems like to me you were just mentally revisiting all these things that happened to you. Does that make sense? It does. And I and I wondered about that. I, I pointed that out as I as I first was starting to try to express my my experience with people. 
And I said, I didn't have the movie. I didn't have the movie where you see all the highs and lows and stuff. I just had this overwhelming sense of remorse. And I don't know why. I, I think because I played that movie every stinking moment of my life that I knew it by heart. <laughs> and I just, I just knew the sense, right? I just, it's kind of like a movie. That's a good movie. That's a funny movie. That's a sad movie. Mine was just remorse and regret. Mm. So yeah, I, I, I did notice that. I didn't have that, that movie experience. When God was speaking to you, did you hear it or did you feel it like it resonated through your whole body? It was both. That's the thing. It's hard to describe it because the, the message, I can't even say the sound, but the, the message came from me as much as it came to me because I wasn't in my body. So there wasn't a barrier, so to speak. It, it really was like, self talking to self or the I am talking to God. It, it was, it, it was that communication of the whole of the one. I, Cause yeah, I, I didn't even, if I used the words, I heard it, it would have to be that it'd be my, like my cells speaking to me, my brain speaking to me, the grass speaking to me. It'd be a, a hearing from absolutely everything in the universe instead of like a hearing from a voice that came over there or came from here. With your communication with God, did you have any questions or was it more he was talking and you were listening? Yeah, he had set the parameters for that. It's going to be a one-way conversation. Mm -hmm. You're going to listen. And it was a beautiful pre-frame for what I was going into because I was like, all right, I'll listen. And as I was shown the structure of my beliefs, and who I thought I was. And as I watched all of those things collapse, there, there was a visual that came to me kind of towards the end of it. And I saw myself as this little girl and I was in a dirty, dirty dress, long stringy hair. And I had, over the course of my life, I had built a barricade around me, kind of like a turret in a castle and the, it was made of bricks of fear and shame and guilt and anger and resentment. And I had just, I watched as, as I slowly built this up around me and I had one window to look at and it was just stained glass. There were filters. There was no clear view of life. There were filters of different colors. You know, my anger and resentment was a red spectrum, you know, the blue sadness uh, green was the jealousy and hate. Um, and as all of that was being proven false, I watched as that castle absolutely crumbled. Like if you know any biblical stories, it was like Joshua in the battle of Jericho when they sounded the horns and the walls just collapsed. It was like that. And that little girl stood up and walked out of there. So it's kind of the, the metaphor that was given to me during that experience. Yeah, there was there were no questions because I've been asking questions my whole life, not necessarily the right questions, but I've been asking questions and I just had complete faith. And that was that I don't know what this means, but it's going to be freaking amazing uh, is is still kind of my motto today. Um, walking in faith, because I believe that we all are responsible for finding our own pathway to our own truth. And the moment that you ask God, hey, is there more to life? Are you really real? God starts sending messages through the spirit to your soul, to your body. That's your intuition. And will lay out a single stepping stone in the path in front of you. And if you're, if you have enough faith to just step out in that one stone, the next one will appear. And the key to that is, is getting out of your own way and just trusting that like the, the absolute foundational skill that everybody has to develop on their path to their truth is trusting and feeling their intuition. It is how 
the universe speaks to us. It is where you will get that direction. That may seem absolutely crazy. There have been times when I've had things to do and I'll be like, oh, I want to go for a walk. And I have no destination. I'll start going for a walk and well, turn left, turn right, end up at a place and end up meeting somebody that absolutely had a huge impact on my life and changed the course of my life. And it happens time and time and time again. So when we get out of the I gotta's and I should's and I must's and I need to, because anywhere there's need, there's not freedom. That's when, if you're listening to your intuition and you have the faith, that's when you get to the magic. That's, that's when the true magic of life creation um, can start and really set you on the path that you really want to be on. It appears that you had a giant change in your life after your NDE. Did that come immediately or did it take time for you to process this NDE and make that change? Both. Um, there were absolute immediate changes. I knew that when I left, um, I knew when I was in the hospital that I would completely disassociate from 90% of the people that I considered in connected friends groups because everything that I had discovered, I realized that if I went back into my circle of, of in, into the, if I went back into the environment that I just came from, that environment I built to support and sustain the identity I had before the friends I had, where I spent my time, how I spent my money, um, how I looked all of that. And I was adamant I wasn't going to go back to that person because I had that choice. I absolutely had that choice. But the things that I discovered that I truly valued were completely different than what that person thought she valued. So I did make immediate changes. Now, it took time to integrate those changes into all aspects of my life. Um, that, that's a broad spectrum. But my core truth of who I am that shifted immediately. And I remember my daughter looking at me after about six weeks and going, who are you? Like, where's my mom? I mean, I, I like this, but who are you? And people did notice I was, I was completely different and um, just bound and determined not to go back to that. I've heard that if you speak to a lot of people that are close to dying, you will hear a lot of people speak of regret and you seem to have experienced that yourself. Why do you think that happens in so many people? There's a study that was done, and I'm, I think it's Betty Brown, I'm not sure. And she uh, was a nurse for end of life patients. And she started noticing a pattern of the things that people regret on their death. And the top two, are I didn't live my own life and I didn't allow myself to be happy. That's the majority of people. So I think that if anyone were to have an NDE right now, the majority of people would be filled with regret. And I mean, we've seen it. Henry David Thoreau says that the, the mass of men are living a life of quiet desperation masked with a smile, but dying inside. And for me, dying was a formality. I had been dead for years. So I think that's the common thing that whether it's an NDE, whether it's a long death process, unless you wake up to your true self and you start valuing your true self and you start really analyzing what you believe and why you believe it and start learning the skills to change it, when you come to your day of death, you're going to be filled with regret and remorse. There's going to be highs, yes, and things that you loved, but did you live your own life? And did you allow yourself to be happy? Because we really, truly are the masters of our own life. We just forgot that. Earlier, you mentioned about listening to your own intuition. Can you give the audience any tips to be able to help them listen to their own intuition? Yes, I have an amazing exercise that I do. Oh, used to be every day. I do it frequently now and, and definitely do it about once a month. And it's a desires exercise. 
because think of it when kids are born they do whatever they desire they want to put that bug in their mouth they put the bug in the mouth they want to wear the yellow shirt they wear the yellow shirt they want to go like they just wear it. they follow their desires they are in so in tune with how their body feels and then shortly our desires start getting judged and they start getting rejected and they start getting shamed you know you're talking to your imaginary friend and that gets shamed little girl comes out and she's got purple shorts on and a yellow shirt and the mom doesn't like the combination so she makes her change it but it's her favorite yellow shirt she wants to go to summer camp for swimming and their parents are like no this summer you're going to go to volleyball camp we slowly learn that our desires must be suppressed so that we can fit in and belong and that's not a bad thing because we're humans and as children, we have no way of sustaining ourselves. We need to belong to a tribe so that we can survive. These are natural things. But then as we grow older, we're already in this habit of suppressing and judging our own desires. And intuition is expressed through the body. So it's a sensation. So to open up to the gateway to your desires and start really starting getting in line with that, um, I will drop, I will give you a link. I've got a, a free full exercise. I'll go through the full exercise, how to do it. I'll give you just the first portion of it here that your audience can use to start just getting aware of their intuition in their own body. And so the first thing to do is first thing in the morning, right when you wake up, no matter what's coming in your mind, just take a deep breath and just ask yourself, what do I desire right now? And let anything and everything come through your mind. I want to get up and have ice cream for breakfast. I want to go back to bed. I want to have sex. I want to go play with my dog. I just want to go shower. Uh, whatever it is, whatever it is, just, just take note of it. And then note how those thoughts feel. Are you judging those thoughts and where did that judgment come from does the thought feel good and then just pick one instead of and, and your monkey mind your critical mind right then is going to be you don't have time for that we don't have time to figure out what we desire we've got to get the kids dressed and get to school and da, 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 all the list of stuff but but start the skill intuition is built also through skill so start the skill of taking a moment taking a deep breath and asking yourself, what do I desire? And that's, that's the first step like of, of building the skill. And the exercise that I'll give your audience um, is, is, is much longer than that and it involves a seven day process, but I'll tell you what, at the end of that seven days, and it only takes 10 to 15 minutes a day, at the end of that seven days, you're gonna be amazed at some of what your true desires are because your answers will start not listing the social norms that you're expected to desire. And you're going to start getting in and hearing the desires of your true self. And you may be surprised at some of the things that come up. But once you have that list at the end of the seven day exercise, you're going to know really what's wanting to come out and express through you. And desire is the energy of creation. And its language is intuition. So the more you're in tune with what your true self desires, the more that fuels your intuition, you add faith and intention and surrender to that. And there's like, it's amazing how fast you can manifest the life that you want. So that would, that would be my tip. I've used it in my life. I've used it with my client's life. It works. Besides the physical things that happen to your body, did you have any negative after effects from the NDE? From the NDE, no, no. Um, I suppose some negative things is like my daughter was really angry with me because in her efforts to try to figure out how to deal with it, she had asked some nurses, what do I do? What do I do? And they all told her that there's these five stages of, of, um, of loss, grief, I think it was. And so they told her, well, first she's going to feel this and then this, and then she's going to try to overcompensate and all, all of these things. And I just was immediately at joy and happiness. And she got very angry at me because the formula that she was giving wasn't matching me. Um, 
there were a lot of people. I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot ones that I was like, oh no, I would like to to keep this relationship. And it we would, you know, when they would see me, they just couldn't physically handle it. And I realized that that comes from a sense of pain, a source of pain within them. And there's a story that they have wrapped around that and has nothing to do with me. Um, but that was painful. And that was pretty much it. Several years later, it took probably eight years. And it was when I started doing some deeper work um, that I realized that I'd never grieved the loss of my arm. And I found out that I was really freaking pissed at myself for having to lose my arm before I woke up. And so that, that had been within me all those years. And I finally let that out and processed it. And the amazing thing is, is as I was doing that process with the multiple processes that I, that I chose to do for it, the phantom limb pain massively reduced. And so I can't say that it's scientifically backed that when you forgive yourself, it reduces phantom pain. Um, I think it probably is scientifically proven that when you forgive yourself, it, it reduces pain. I think that's backed up on the mind, uh, Heart Mind Institute website. Um, but it, it, that was what the truth was in my life. That was, that was the negative effect. And I, honestly, I was just so happy that at the time I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, I, I lost an arm. That's what I had to do. But it, I did have to come to that realization that, and look back over my life and realize there was probably half a dozen times that I can, I can easily name where God tried to get my attention and give me an opportunity to wake up to my greatness and to my true self. And I didn't do it. And so that was, that was a hard process. You mentioned something earlier and I didn't want to interrupt you, but you said that your friends couldn't handle it or handle you. What about the new you was it that they couldn't handle? It's a broad spectrum. Um, some people couldn't handle the fact that I wasn't jumping in their gossip and talking negatively. It's just not going to do that. Uh, that I wouldn't start, you know, tearing up down other people to make me and my friends look better. Just wasn't going to do that. Um, but mostly it was a physical thing. It was amazing how many people just couldn't handle the physical trauma to my arm. They couldn't look at me. They couldn't look at my arm. Like they couldn't make eye contact. And, and so that, that's, like I said, is some story around, around that. So even if I, if I wanted to keep certain friends, they had their own, own issues with it. And, you know, family has, as the thing is, is when you lose an arm, nobody, nobody knows what to do. I had absolutely zero support. Nobody had any answers for me. Nobody knew what phantom limb pain was. They didn't know what I was going through. And so I was really just out there on my own. And my heart goes out to people who have gone through something like this and didn't have the post-traumatic growth, like the massive transformation into true self that I had. I know it's not the common, the, the common outcome. And I really my heart goes out to him because I can't imagine being still stuck in an additional trauma and having absolutely nobody understand what you're going through. So thank, thank God I did have some, some strong people that just kind of held space. They didn't know what to do, but you know, they could look me in the eye and still love me. After your NDE, have you noticed that you have any new abilities that you didn't have prior? Those are developing more and more and more as I continue to change this, the, the aspects of my identity that still were tethered to beliefs of limitation. And as my experience and skill with intuition expands, yeah, there is, there is some, I could say psychic abilities. There's sensing of energies, being really in tune with the energies around. Um, channeling channeling when i'm doing some healings especially in ceremonies 
um, I just, I, I am a channel for a voice. I did a, a beautiful ayahuasca ceremony about two and a half weeks ago. <laughs> and, you know, I went into it kind of a hoping, I was hoping that I would kind of get a, a redo of the near death experience, you know, dissolving into the universe and everything. Mm -hmm. And, and what actually ended up happening was there was this an angelic voice singing through me, just being channeled through me. And I'm not a singer. But what came through me was definitely not from me. Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of cool uh, abilities that anybody can develop. And now I'm really focused on developing those and allowing that. And the interesting thing with, with like psychic abilities and, and energy healing work and channeling is that you develop those skills by desiring them and then getting out of the way. So that requires a whole nother skill set of, right? How do I get out of my own way? How do I like get in coherence, my heart and my mind and relax my body so that I can release and get my brain waves up to a higher vibration so that all of that can happen? Because if we're stuck in our prefrontal cortex and, you know, the alpha beta brain waves, we're not going to be able to express ourselves or even feel those sensations in like a higher spirit way. It's interesting that you had an ayahuasca experience. Did you also have all the vomiting and being sick with that as well? No, it was the weirdest thing. It was so weird. Um, I'm, I'm in the, the group and amazing, amazing shaman. So we did Sananga for the eyes for vision and we did Hape which kind of is a grounding um, tobacco that's blown up the nostrils and then started doing some singing and took our first dose of ayahuasca, did some breath work. It was amazing breath work. Did our second dose of ayahuasca, did our third dose of ayahuasca. And at this point, people are, are starting to get into their experience and I'm just sitting there. We do our fourth dose of ayahuasca we're like three and a half hours into this right now. And I'm, I'm kind of feeling, you know, tired. It's late at night and I'm not a late night person and not feeling, I'm not feeling anything, maybe a little tingling. So I call the shaman over. I'm like, when is this stuff supposed to kick in? And he said, you're not feeling anything. I said, nope. He said, let me go get some more. I'll give you another dose and then I'll tell you why. And so he came back, I took the dose and he asked me, what did you expect when you came here? I said, well, to be honest, I, I, I kind of wanted something like my near death experience just to experience that again on that intense level without having to lose an arm. And I said, okay, what, what have you been thinking all these hours? we were up in the mountains and I said, I've been laying here and looking at the stars. I don't, I, I've been living in the city so long. I haven't seen the stars and my favorite constellation, the seven sisters is above me. And I've just been watching it and, and watching everybody in their experience and listening to the songs and absolutely just loving the environment and, you know, sending love to her because she's having a hard time. And, and said, okay. He said, you're not feeling anything because you're already there. What do you mean I'm already there? He said, you're, you're already awakened. You're already enlightened. And man, when he said enlightened, my ego hit the wall. I was like, nope, no, I am not a Jesus. There's no way I can take that, that label on. I am not perfect. And he's like, do you think Jesus was perfect? I'm like, well, I mean, reputation's pretty good. And he said, enlightenment isn't not being human enlightenment is allowing all of the experiences of humanity to fill your body and choosing the ones that you're going to express and i was like okay that that actually makes sense and he said your your problem is is that you're not allowing yourself to believe that you're enlightened you've got a story wrapped around that I'm like, oh dang another story crap okay all right. He said, well, what else were you expecting? I was like, well, I was, I was kind of hoping for a surprise, just something, a surprise. And he said, well, surprise yourself. And I was like, all right, how do I do that? 
And so he, he sat in front of me and we started doing Om. Have you ever done any like Om chanting? A very little. Yeah. So it's, it's amazing. It's the sound of creation. It's a, it's a sound that's in all of God's uh, names. And so we started oming. And then that's, I just really got into that. And I was like, when it just became so effortlessly, and that's when that voice channeled through me. And I had that amazing divine experience. And I have no idea how long that went on for. Um, but when when it was over, I just said, I'm done. I'm going to go to sleep. And so I went into my room and I laid down. And the interesting thing is that I've been sitting up and laying down, sitting up and laying down. And I generally lay on my left side because it's awkward for me to lay on my right if I don't have a pillow to brace my arm and stuff. And I had an extra pillow. So I rolled over on my right. And when I rolled over on my right, the wave of nausea hit me like a freight train. And so I went up and I went and I, I threw up and then I slept soundly for four hours. Mm. So yeah, mine was a really, really strange ayahuasca experience for sure. How were the people around you? I mean, were they getting sick or were they freaking out? And Yeah, there was, okay. So one gentleman, there was a lot of laughter. Um, there was one lady that was, that I knew and she was really struggling and like kind of writhing and, and you could, t- I could just tell she was in a not good space. And so he wasn't throwing up. She wasn't throwing up. Um, the lady next to me threw up for a good 11 hours. Wow. Yeah. She was processing some deep, deep sorrow. And it was so fascinating because in the morning when I woke up, she was still throwing up. But the interesting thing was that she was laughing while she was doing it and smiling. Mm-hmm. Because she had made the connection mm-hmm. that... Aya was giving her exactly what she needed. You know, it doesn't, doesn't give you what you want. It gives you what you need. And so she was just throwing up and breaking up all these energetic patterns of sorrow and grief. And so, and she was just so full of joy. Just she transformed in that whole experience. Um, so bright and shining and happy and light. And the lady next to me, I thought she was kind of having an experience like mine because she, she took her, 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 doses of ayahuasca and laid down and pretty much never moved the rest of the night. Hmm. And when we all met in the morning to, you know, share our experiences and kind of integrate, she's like, I, I left my body and I was out in galaxies. I was, I, it was quick and she was just gone for hours. So, um, she kind of had the experience I wanted, but I got Hmm. the experience I needed. Hmm. So yeah, the, the vomiting thing, um, and the next morning, there were two other people coming to, to take a uh, Yopa Waska, and that's supposed to make you vomit as well. And boy, I got to tell you, both of the, neither one of them threw up and both of them were in such a state of joy and laughter and happiness that it was just phenomenal. What inspires you about your NDE? Possibility. If I can change in under two minutes, my whole identity then it doesn't matter who you are or what you think about yourself or what I think about myself, it can change. That's what inspires me. It's, 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 it's what drives me because I know it. I don't believe it. I know it. I've seen it happen with other people. It happened with me. And I I consider my NDE, you know, this is the greatest gift I've ever given myself. And if this is what it took for me to actually start living my life full of joy and, and enthusiasm and fulfillment, then fine. I'll go through hand. I'll go through life one handed, but yeah, possibility and knowing that people can right now choose to start living their own life. Do you fear death at all? Nope. Death actually, death is a story that this body needs to believe as part of its survival system. If this body didn't fear death, we'd step out in front of a car. We'd eat, drink, whatever we want. We, we would do all sorts of things that would lead to that death. So death is a necessary part of survival for this body, but we aren't this body. We are an expression of the universe expressing itself through this body. And we do have our own bodily consciousness that is alive and awake within it. But life is consciousness. Life is not this body. 
So I don't fear death because when my consciousness leaves this body, it will go somewhere else. I will go somewhere else. Maybe I'll come back. Maybe I'll go to a different galaxy. Maybe I, who knows what I'll do. Um, but no, th th death isn't to be feared. Death is just a transition from one state to another. All right. You mentioned earlier that you're going to give us exercises. Can you tell us about the class or courses that you're offering? Yeah. Like I, I mentioned to you before we started recording, I took a couple of years off of coaching and speaking and decided to just do some deeper work and some deeper study. And so I am relaunching my brand March 1st and my first class comes out and it's, it's, I call it a foundation step. And it's the first step in your pathway to your true self. And what I've done is I've synthesized all of the core elements that everybody's going to need to learn the skills to master their own self and to master their own pathway to their own truth. So the first course is going to reveal to you some of the things that got revealed to me in the ditch. What do you, your true self, really value? And when we can discover what you really value, and you will in this course, then in seven areas of your life, we're going to take what are your goals in those areas? You know, and everybody's got these sticky goals that, well, I've been wanting to lose weight. I know I need to lose weight. Or I know I need to get a, a promotion in the job. We're going to take all the goals that you've had that you just can't seem to accomplish. And there's a way to align those to your highest values, which you now know, so that they become like tethered to your inner energy system. Because with your highest values, align your desires. They're going to reflect each other. So those are the things that drive your purpose and create your reality. And when you can attach goals to it in a way that actually rewires your brain and in this process, because of the way it's done, it starts to rewire your brain in a way that, that starts building the myelin sheath. Now, the more myelin sheath a neurological pathway has around it in the brain, the faster the transmission and the stronger the belief. So we're going to do that. And I, I got to tell you that when, when you know what your true highest values are and you can align your goals to them, there's no effort. There's no, I got to, there's no, I needs, there's no, I shoulds. All of those things that you've been needing, shoulding to do start become effortless. And it's freaky weird. You will start finding those things curious and interesting, and you'll want to spend your energy on them. It's, Jeff, it's almost like magic, but when you can align these things, now you've got a really strong, firm foundation, and we're going to move into the next course will be on desires and intention and surrender all of the things to give you that faith for that next step on your pathway. And the courses just kind of build on each other. And at, and at the end of the foundational course series, that's when I have, um, I haven't got them released yet, but I'll have a series of classes for whatever your interest is, maybe you're interested in more of the spiritual aspect of personal awareness and self mastery. Maybe you want to know some things that are just more like, just give me some more processes. Just give me some more sciencey stuff because they're, they're, they're all connected. You know, science is the language of spirituality. You know, science has finally proven that there, there is a God, there is a unifying force that holds everything together and that consciousness is energy. So I, I like to lay out a bunch of different courses because like I said, everybody's responsible to find their own path to their own truth. My path will not look like yours. The things that I wanted to study and learn to get where I'm at, maybe you don't have to, we're all different. So if people want to find out more about that, the registration for the course opens on March 1st and the course actually starts March 15th. And so you can go to moonwalkerlife.me to find that. That's your website? Yes, that is. People may want to reach out to you and ask you questions or chat with you. Are you open to that? And if so, Absolutely. how can they find you? Yeah, um, you can just get on, <laughs> on my website. There's a contact me tab and you can um, just email me. My email's on there. It's, it's walker at moonwalkerlife.me. All right. Well, you've got the course. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want us to know about? 
Well, I'm having as, as soon as the course gets filled out so that people can, you know, continue down that that pathway. Uh, I am launching a podcast called Let's Talk Shift, and that will be interviewing um, just a lot of experts and everyday people on how they shifted their life, what led up to that, what are the skills that they learned, what are the techniques, anything that they have to share with the audience to help them out. And these are going to be from coaches and, you know, uh, psychological professors and, and people that are really kind of breaking ground in the field of self-awareness and self-mastery, as well as, you know, the, the ayahuasca and the plant medicines and the animal, animal medicines. So it's, it's all of the different aspects of healing that I'll be uh, discussing and launching on that podcast. Do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, it is in development. Like I said, I'm just relaunching. So it moonwalker life I've got secured. I do not have it built out yet. So Make sure to to look for that because there, there'll be a lot of that on there. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? The stories that you you tell yourself aren't true. There's no there's 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 no truth for anything that you say about yourself that doesn't expand you. If the way you talk to yourself contracts you and takes away from your energy. That is the evidence that it's not true because at your core, you are divinity expressing itself in this body. Anytime that you have a thought, a feeling, or even notice yourself doing an action that feels negative, feels bad, realize like that's not your true self. And it's really your true self trying to get your attention to say, Hey, wake up, come inside. Get to know yourself, your true self, and you're going to fall in love. So wherever you are on your path, I would encourage you to find somebody that you resonate with, somebody who's been exactly where you are, just like I have, that you resonate with, that can help you learn the skills, because you have absolutely everything that you need to heal and thrive and have a fulfilling life. You just forgot how to access it. Moon, thank you for that message, and thank you again for being our guest today. I really appreciate you, and I wish you the best. Thank you. It's been my honor. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara Podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.